Okay, guys, today we're going to finish up um, the Cold War. We're going to get into talking a little bit about uh, communism in China. So uh, with that, let's, um, let's dive right into this. The last thing we talked about was the Cuban Missile Crisis and how the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis almost brought the United States and the Soviet Union um, uh, to blows and, and almost caused a, a trigger to war, but it didn't. It was... Um, it was, but it was closed. It's often referred to as the brink. So we're going to pick up in the 1960s and we're going to round this thing up. One thing I would like for you to uh, write down on this is to write down the two questions. Uh, the first uh, learning objective question is what was the Cold War like in the, in the 60s through the 90s? And explain the development of communism in China and how it has impacted China. So those are the things we're going to address during this lesson. Um, so let's look at the last few decades of the Cold War uh, after the Cuban Missile Crisis leading up into the 1990s. Um, once the Cuban Missile Crisis happens, um, uh, things sort of begin to relax. Uh, we call this relaxation of, uh, relaxation of tensions uh, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. We refer to that as detente, uh, and you can see it spelled here, D-E-T-E-N-T-E. -E um, so this period of detente is going to go on for a little while. Um, this is going to go on really until the 1980s. Um, the United States even started trading a little bit with the Soviet Union during this period. Uh, but by 1979, detente is going to come to an end. And the main reason why is because the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. And this is going to really seem ironic uh, in just a minute whenever I explain to you what's going on in Afghanistan. But anyway, there's a group in Afghanistan known as the Taliban. And the Taliban is uh, anti-Soviet. Of course, the Soviet Union is close to Afghanistan. And um, they really have a disdain for uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union wanted to remove the Taliban. And um, again, they were anti-Soviet and they were extremely fundamentalist. Uh, the funny thing about all of this is that the Taliban was actually receiving help from the United States, which would later come back to haunt us in 9-11, um, as most of those people that uh, were involved in the 9-11 plot uh, were former Taliban members, and of course, the United States trained them, gave them weapons, and so on. And then the U.S. has to go in in 9-11 and actually um, try to remove the Taliban, even though they're still there, even to this day. Um, some of the satellite states, the states that were in what we call the Communist Bloc or in that Warsaw Pact, some of them began to try to pull away from the Soviet Union. Uh, some were successful, some were not. The Soviets always used a uh, military iron fist when some of these uh, states would try to pull away. Things began to change in the Soviet Union uh, once Leonid uh, Brezhnev dies. He was the uh, leader of the Soviet Union um, through most of the 70s into the 80s. Uh, a new guy is going to come to power. His name is Mikhail Gorbachev, or Gorbachev, however you want to say it. Uh, he comes to power in 1985, and he knew that if the Soviet Union was going to survive, they needed to do some radical changes. By the 1980s, the Soviet Union had been locked in this arms race with the United States for you know, three or four decades, and uh, it was taking a toll on their economy, and um, the economy was not very good for the Soviet Union. Most of the products and things that were made uh, under this communist government were not very good, and they didn't really have a lot of trading partners to, to sell their goods and things to. And, and they needed money to keep up with the U.S. in order to build the missiles and things that they needed for the arms race. So things were not good with the Soviet economy. Mikhail Gorbachev comes in and he introduces something known as Glasnost. Glasnost uh, was an openness of political issues. They began to sort of say and speak and, and talk a little bit more about what was going on in the Soviet Union. And, and they even started begin. some people began to speak out against the idea of communism. So Glasnost uh, is that openness uh, that the people had. Another term that you need to know is perestroika. Perestroika was a restructuring of the Soviet economy to try to make the Soviet economy better because it was in such bad shape by the 1980s. 
due to all the spending of them trying to keep up in the arms race. So Perestroika uh, was a restructuring of the Soviet economy. Make sure you're familiar with both of those words, glasnost and Perestroika, and make sure you know who Gorbachev is. Again, Perestroika sought to establish a market economy for the Soviet Union. And they began to uh, open up some of the land uh, for private property ownership. Um, so we saw a change in uh, the Soviet Union under Gorbachev. Gorbachev began to embrace the ideas of the United States and um, even asked the United States for help in some of their economic reforms. Uh, U.S. companies began to appear in Moscow. Things like McDonald's and Coca-Cola and those things began to start popping up in um, the Soviet Union for the very first time. Um, again, um, the Soviet Union, because of their economic uh, problems during the 1980s, began to stop sending money to some of these uh, communist countries in Europe that they had supported since the end of the war, uh, since the end of World War II. So um, when these countries realized that the Soviet Union was in no, no shape to try to stop them, some of them began to pull away from uh, the communist bloc or the satellite bloc, whichever one you want to call it. And there's a picture of Gorbachev. So when does the fall of communism happen? In 1991, uh, the Russian military and the Communist Party are going to arrest Gorbachev. This is going to trigger a riot and uh, really a, a revolution, if you want to say a revolution. Uh, but it it triggered this riot and protest in Moscow, and eventually Gorbachev is released. Um, shortly after his release, though, he resigns his presidency in favor of a new leader. His name is Boris Yeltsin, and um, the USSR collapses uh, once Boris Yeltsin takes over, um, and there were the communist leaders were basically thrown out. All of the Soviet republics that were part of the Soviet Union were given their independence by 1992. And communism disappears from Eastern Europe. And we talked about Germany earlier, how East Germany and West Germany eventually united in uh, the 1989 and 1990. Uh, this was sort of you know, the beginning of the fall of communism. And then by 1992, um, you see communism uh, pretty much disappear from all of Europe. So what's it like today, well, or what's it like towards the end of the 20th century? Uh, at the end of the Cold War, the United States, again, is the wealthiest nation in the world, more so than the Soviet Union, of course. Uh, America is going to establish these multinational corporations that are going to dominate global industries. And it's sort of ironic because we're sort of talking about that now, especially with uh, the virus that's just happened recently um, and how you know some of these corporations had on overseas and now they're sort of being drawn back in to being in the U.S. But uh, during this time, um, the United States and, and American industries were beginning to move around globally and establish global markets in other places in the world. U.S. culture begins to spread uh, during the late 20th century, like we just said, with communism falling, it opens up the door for a lot of U.S. culture. Things like McDonald's and Coca-Cola and those places began to move into places that had never seen any of these types of, of restaurants and, and, and soda drinks and so on. So uh, U.S. culture begins to spread and becomes uh, a global culture. The United States, again, had unrivaled diplomatic power. And of course, they could use their leverage with their economy. Uh, to do all sorts of things in different parts of the world. Uh, we're going to use some of that diplomatic power in Yugoslavia where there's going to be issues, uh, ethnic issues that are going to crop up uh, where a lot of uh, executions and things are going to happen against certain ethnic groups. We've used it in the Middle East, and of course we're going to use it in Latin America. Okay, so that's going to pretty much do it for uh, the end of the Cold War. Uh, the next part is going to be about the development of communism in China. Now, um, this is also sort of part of the Cold War. Of course, the Cold War is mainly between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but communism is going to emerge in China. And we've already discussed this uh, 
uh, briefly when we were going through the Cold War lesson, but let's look at a little more about um, China and how it develops into a communist nation. Most of what happens in China occurs um, in the 1930s that's going to impact them becoming communists. You have these nationalists and communists that are fighting each other for control of China in the 1930s. But of course, World War II comes along and both sides are going to have to put aside their differences in order to fight against the Japanese who are overtaking China uh, during uh, World War II. But after World War II, the two sides are going to pick up and they're going to begin fighting each other again, the nationalists and the communists. By um, 1949, uh, the war is going to come to an end. The communists are going to win and uh, the nationalists are going to be forced uh, to leave China or face execution. So a lot of the nationalists are going to flee to an island off the coast of China. And you need to know this. Uh, the name of the island is Formosa, but eventually they change it into uh, the country of Taiwan, and it still exists today. And of course, the Chinese and the Taiwanese do not like each other, mainly because of the, this reason. So in 1949, communists are going to take over. Most of um, their uh, most of the help that they're going to get during this war uh, between the nationalists and the communists is going to come from the Soviet Union. Uh, again, most of the nationalists would flee China to the island of Taiwan, and the United States is going to back the island of Taiwan um, because, again, we didn't like communists and it was the Cold War, so the U.S. naturally uh, backed the nationalists over the communists. The communists are going to be led by Mao Zedong, which we've already talked about. Uh, Mao is going to receive most of his support from the Soviet Union, who was glad glad to have a communist neighbor. If you don't know this, China and the Soviet Union, or China and Russia, are uh, next door neighbors. So again, they they love the idea that China was going to be next door, and that China was going to be friendly, and China was going to be communist. Again, here's a picture of Mao, and here's a picture of the Chinese flag. So once Mao takes over, he's going to begin to rebuild China. And what he's going to do, one of the first things he's going to do, is he's sort of going to follow Stalin's blueprint. He's going to seize land, and he's going to give that land to the peasants. And these peasants are going to be uh, forced to work on these collective farms, just like the Soviet Union. Uh, communists also took control of all the industry throughout China, and uh, industry actually expanded under Mao's leadership. Mao's policy uh, is going to be called the Great Leap Forward. Uh, this new plan, the Great Leap Forward, uh, was to make collective farms larger and more productive. Uh, but there's going to be issues with these collective farms. Uh, the plan is going to fail uh, for a few different reasons. Um, number one, the Chinese citizens didn't support this plan uh, because, again, it was forcing people to work on these large farms instead of growing food for themselves and for uh, to feed their families. And, of course, there was a lot of starvation. Uh, real bad planning by the government. They didn't see a lot of these problems and issues with these huge collective farms. And during this period, poor weather uh, led to famines and caused a lot of starvation. So they were in really bad shape under the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward, though, was Mao's plan. And um, it, this plan was to make these collective farms more productive and larger. Another plan comes out after the Great Leap Forward, known as the Great Cultural Revolution. The Great Cultural Revolution was where they tried to increase industrial production. Um, and... This was done under Mao, but again, um, Mao was doing this because he failed uh, to modernize China, uh, whereas China was still stuck mainly as an agricultural uh, country, and uh, they weren't industrialized as much as Mao wanted, wanted them to be during this period. So uh, Mao's actually going to put this in place in the late 1960s, but he was unhappy with the direction of his country. So he introduced this new plan, which was the Great Cultural Revolution. Make sure you understand what the Great Cultural Revolution was. Uh, the Great Cultural Revolution was an attempt to revive the revolutionary spirit in China. <laughs>
Okay, so Mao would call for an end to this revolution in 1969. Um, many individuals, though, continued the practices until 1976 when Mao died. Just to go back real quick uh, to the last slide. Um, the people that are going to execute this plan uh, are going to be Chinese uh, students. And uh, they're going to set out to pretty much purge a lot of the people that were against this idea and um, of course this is what's going to lead to a lot of, uh, of problems uh, but this this plan will go on until 1976 when Mao would die and the great cultural revolution would come to an end uh, again this revolution was headed up by young students called the red guards they targeted teachers scientists and artists they shut down schools and sent intellectuals to the country to work on farms. And they killed thousands of people who resisted. And this was mainly the practices that were used during this great cultural revolution. China was in chaos and many factories were shut down and farm production dropped during the great cultural revolution. Again, here's some pictures of the farms and of course the idea of the Great Leap Forward. Um, and again, both of these policies were, were not very successful at all for China. It's really not going to be until the, the early 1970s when Richard Nixon actually makes a visit to China that China is going to open up trade. And that's where China would begin to grow. By the 1980s, of course, we know what happens and we're, we're dealing with some of that now. Uh, in the 1980s, China is going to be opened up even more. Um, and a lot of, of companies are going to move some of their production and manufacturing to China because of cheap labor. And uh, that's a big issue right now in the news. So, again, this sort of explains what happened in China, why China is the way it is today, how they became communists. Make sure you understand those terms, too. Make sure you know the leader, Mao Zedong, understand what the Great Leap Forward and the Great Cultural Revolution was. Um, and so on. So um, that should help you answer your learning objective. And that'll be it. And we will pick up talking a little bit about Egypt uh, in the next one and how communists are going to actually try to impact Egypt as well. Okay, catch you guys on the next one.